Hi, this is Mr. Ford from MrFordsClass.com, as well as Mr. Ford's Guide to the A-plus Certification Exam, How to Be a Computer Technician on iTunes. And today we're going to look at types of printers. This is going to kick off a brand new topic on printer technology, which is covered on the A-plus exam. So let's get going here. Why do we need to know about printers for a, as a computer technician? I'm kind, of, I'm kind of torn on this, to be honest with you, because there are really two types of printers. You have the very expensive printers, which you will not work on. For example, in our classroom, we have a very expensive Dell laser printer. As an A-plus computer technician, you are probably not going to work on that expensive Dell laser printer because it's an expensive Dell laser printer. What you would do is you would actually go through specific training at Dell on how to use their printer. And this goes for other types of expensive printers as well. You're going to go through specialized training for that specific printer from that company. So for example, an HP printer, you would get training from an HP provider, uh, Dell computer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then you have the other type of printer, which are the cheap printers, which might cost under $50 to buy, and you're charging a labor fee of $50 to $100. It's not worth fixing. So I do have some bias on this material. I really don't think that printers honestly belong too much on the A-plus exam. They have made some significant changes. When I took my original exam back in 2002, 2003, printers made up a large portion of the test. Unfortunately, it was too big. The A-plus has come down on their percentage of printer questions, but you will still run into printer issues on the exam. So there's my prejudice as far as printers. I don't really like to have to talk to them about them too much because, like I said, the expensive ones you won't work on because they require special training, and the cheap ones aren't worth fixing because the, by the time you're done fixing them, you've, you've just bought a new printer. Let's look at the types of printers. There are six main categories of printers. We have the impact printer. We have the inkjet printer. We have dye sublimation printers. We have thermal printers. We have solid ink printers. And we have laser printers which we really don't discuss too much in this specific topic because the A-plus exam does go into laser printers in more depth than the other five. So we will actually have a special presentation just on laser printers as well as the laser printing process and all that fun stuff that you will need to know for your exam. Here's a breakdown of the classifications. And again, this PowerPoint, for those of you just joining us, this PowerPoint is available online at mrfordsclass.com. All right, let's look at the old impact printers. Think old typewriter. This is probably the oldest of the type of printers that you can run into. And what happens here is you actually have physical contact. You have something hitting a ribbon that hits paper. So it hits the ribbon and hits the paper. It's going to leave a mark in that way. And we have two basic types of impact printers. We have the daisy wheel and we have the dot matrix. The daisy wheel. This is a picture I pulled off of Wikipedia. It was a Creative Commons, and as you can see, we gave the source on this one. But I want you to take a look, if you can see it, the, you really can't see it too well, I just looked at the picture a little closely, the, um, the, art, the artist behind it took some liberties and kind of blurred some letters out. But what you're going to get on the daisy wheel are actual models of letters. You're actually going to have, like a J will be an actual J, an A will be an actual A. It's a real imprint of a letter. The daisy wheel could either have a ball, which had all the, number, the letters and numbers and characters on it, or it would have the wheel like we just saw in the previous slide. Now, the bad thing about the daisy wheel was that there was no, there was no way to change fonts. So for example, in our day and age where we have our word processing and you want to change fonts here and change fonts there, you couldn't do it with a daisy wheel because all the characters were on that specific wheel or that little ball. To change fonts, you would actually have to remove the physical device and put in a new device so you would get those extra characters. This also obviously made drawing you know, graphics very, very hard because, again, you couldn't do direct graphics. You couldn't do real graphics with a daisy wheel. In order for the daisy wheel to make text on paper, the correct letter would be located and then it would strike the ink ribbon, which would then leave a mark on the paper. That's more or less how a daisy wheel worked. The letter molding on the wheel would then cause the impression of ink to be placed in the paper. Um, here's a little back story for me. I remember I was an undergrad at University of South Florida, Go Bulls, in uh, 1994. I graduated in 94. 
And my grandmother bought me a word processor, not a computer, but a word processor. And what the word processor did was you would type into the word processor and you would save your files. It was all on floppies. And if you wanted to run a spell check, you would have to put the spell check floppy in the computer and load that. And it would check your spelling. And it was a green screen. When you hit print, it would go. Well, it took forever. And it was very loud. So when my roommate, uh, if I was working on a paper late at night, I couldn't print it because my roommate would duck for cover because, you know, it was, <laughs> it was a drive-by shooting. So that was the old daisy wheels. And I, I've got that brother word processor somewhere. Uh, I don't know why. I don't even think it works, but I, I still hold on to it. <laughs> the QWERTY keyboard. This is kind of an FYI. The QWERTY keyboard, if you look at your keyboard right now, you can see, most of us can see, that you have the Q-W-E-R-T-Y right at the top. That's called a QWERTY keyboard. And the rumor is, or the, the, the history is, that the QWERTY keyboard was invented because back in the day, back in the old, 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 old days, the, I'm in school, you might hear the bells occasionally, the people would type, you know, what they needed to type, and they were typing so fast that the keys, when they came in and hit the paper, they would get jammed. And it would physically require somebody to put their hands in and pull back the keys to unjam the, to unjam the printer, or the printer, but the, uh, the typewriter. The keyboard was supposed to be invented to slow the typist down. Now, if you look at other sources, they say that's not true. It wasn't designed like that. It was um, because of those are the most commonly used letters, and those were the strongest of your fingers, whatever. I like the idea that it was done to actually slow people down. That sounds a little more entertaining to me. The dot matrix, take a look at this picture real quick. You will see a big concept in dot matrix, and that is it's not actually made of solid letters. Dot matrix makes little dots and puts them in a matrix. If you remember back to the, uh, the matrix, the movie, when all these little numbers came, come down the screen, those were little matrixes, okay? While the daisy wheel has basically become an extinct species among printers, the dot matrix is alive and well and still very expensive in some cases. What happens to the dot matrix is that, um, actually there's a word there I wanted to, to uh, define real quick, hard copy. This is a geek word for paper output. The dot matrix advantage. The dot matrix, like we said earlier, makes little dots and it can make those dots into any shape, any size. So unlike the daisy wheel, where you had a set limit of numbers, and you had a set limit number of sizes, the dot matrix could make any type of font, any type of size. In fact, with a dot matrix, for the first time, we could actually start making graphics. The dot matrix printer uses a bunch of print wires or pins that will come together and form different letters, different characters, different fonts, and even graphics. The print wires are housed in a print head. When I was working on this presentation, I actually went to Newegg.com. I really need to approach them about a <laughs> promotional deal because I talk about them a lot. But I went to Newegg.com and I looked up dot matrix. And these printers are more for the commercial market. For example, the high schools in the district I work at use the dot matrix printers, I believe, for the report cards and use more of an inkjet or, or colored laser for the progress reports. But that's, um, dot matrix are still alive and well. And I think I saw one or two for like three, four hundred dollars. Here is a basic diagram of how a dot matrix works. We see that we have the spool of ink soaked ribbon. This is where the ribbons are at. You have the blue area right here, which is the print head, which contains all the different wires. You have the paper and the ribbon. What I don't have is that there is a metal bar behind the paper, which allows kind of a strong backing. So when the print head hits, it, the paper doesn't kind of go off on its own. It actually strikes the, the metal bar, which keeps the paper where it's supposed to be. There is a picture of a print head. And here is a picture of a ribbon casing. Draft versus letter. With the dot matrix, we introduced something called uh, near letter quality. Remember that the daisy wheel actually was a molding of a letter. If you wanted an A or you wanted a B, it was actually the B or the A. It was actually the letter. 
with dot matrix, it wasn't so much the letter, it was little dots that got hit together that made, a, that made the letter. So we had what we called near letter quality, meaning how close did it look like to the actual letter from a daisy wheel. We had two types of standards. We had the nine pin, which used nine pins to make the, the letter or the number of the character. This is called draft quality printing. I still remember back in the day, my mom had a Mac a computer from her school, which had a daisy wheel printer. And you would use draft quality printing if you wanted a very quick kind of preview of what the document would look like. So you would do draft printing, it would, it would spit it out, it wasn't pretty, it wasn't meant to be pretty, and you would have an idea of what it looked like. If you wanted to actually print up something that you were going to turn in, then you would use the 24 pin, you would use the high quality printing setting. Here is an inkjet. Also known as bubble jets, this is specific to Canon. Although, you know, it's like Kleenexes and tissues, yes, it's a canon term, but back in the day, people referred to ink jets and bubble jets pretty much the same way. You can also refer to it as an ink dispersion, uh, if you want to be a real geek. It was created by Canon back in 1977. While the dot matrix allowed users to add images, graphics to printing, it really wasn't that great for image quality. It really wasn't that great for image output. The inkjet was the answer to that. It was, um, it, it was fantastic. You could actually make pictures. So you could you know, print out what was on your screen. I remember when we first got our very first inkjet printer, we printed out a picture and wiped out all the ink in just one, one picture. And the paper was wet with ink. Um, it, was just, it was just icky. So it was a step up, though, because we had color. Here are some special inkjet words that you'll also run into in other cases. Print resolution means how good is the picture? How good is the output? How clear does it look? How nice does it look? And dots per inch or DPI. Now remember, with a dot matrix as well as inkjet, it's little blobs of color, little blobs of ink that get as close as they possibly can to make the text or the image. The closer you can put these little blobs of ink, the better the image quality, the better the text. So DPI dots per inch means how close can we get this ink together. The higher the number, the better off you are. Pages per minute. I don't know about any of you out there, but I remember as a college student having a paper due, let's say at 2 o'clock, finishing it off at around 12 o'clock, having to walk to class and hitting print and just kind of like, come on, print, 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 and, you know, the one page would <laughs> sentence one done, you know, <laughs> sentence two done, and you're just hoping you would be done enough time for you to get it, bring it to class, you know, before it's too late. So pages per minute is how fast the printer actually spits out pages. Cost per page, printers cost money. How much is each page costing you or the company? Now, this is something for CPAs and accountants to figure out. If you really want to know what your bottom line is, you would look at how much it costs to actually print out the, the stuff that you're printing out. Uh, back, I would say, about 10 years ago, I used to have a disc jockey business, and I used to do mobile disc jockeying for weddings, and I used to send out newsletters to clients. And I would print up newsletters. Well, it was costing me money. It was costing me paper. It was costing me ink. Um, it was costing time it was cost per page. And what you do is you look at your cost per page and see if it's worth it. So in my case, what I did is I had to drop some graphics. I didn't need all the fancy colors. I didn't need all the fancy paper. It wasn't worth it. So I was able to drop my cost per page. How inkjets work. Basically, how an inkjet works is like this. You have ink. It gets heated up. It gets spit through a nozzle and they make colors, and the colors come together and they make pictures and et cetera, et cetera. So that's basically how an inkjet works. There are a couple terms to know, such as print heads, ink cartridges, power supplies, traverse guides, as well as a storage and cleaning area. Let's look at the guts of an inkjet printer. You can see from the highlighted area, this is the cartridge as well as storage area. With inkjets, especially the early, early inkjets, it was a mess. If you didn't print all the time, it became a real mess because it just, 
the ink would dry or the ink would leak. It was just, it was just a nasty, icky process. So what happens is, is that when you're done printing, the print heads, the cartridges will move to a storage area and they'll rest there. And in the resting area, you'll have a kind of a stopper where it'll actually kind of, you know, plug up the ink so the ink's not dripping out. It'll have a cleaning area. So, you know, when you need to clean the, some printers will clean the ink heads before they start printing. It was just a storage area, a rest area for you to keep the ink where you, where you had it before you actually needed to use it. That was very clear, right? <laughs> um, moving on. Traverse Guide. This actually moves the printhead back and forth. This allows the printhead to go back and forth, uh, left to right on the paper, so it could actually drop off its ink and make your picture. Also, notice there is a, a like a floppy cable here. There's like a ribbon cable. This ribbon cable is providing data to the printhead on how to make the actual image. Ink. This is going to be a fun little topic. Welcome to the Gillette Business Model, or AKA Freebie Marketing. When I began working at the Kate Center, there was a program where we would donate computers to needy families. And one of the things that we would donate would be the printer, the monitor, the, key the keyboard, the mice, and the system unit. Well, it took me a little bit of convincing, but we stopped donating printers. In fact, we stopped taking printers altogether. When we got printers, we just threw them out. And I had to explain why. When a printer costs $30, but the ink costs $40, if you can't afford to buy the printer, you can't afford to own the printer. Meaning that, yeah, we give you a free printer, but that was the cheap part. You have to go buy the ink, and the ink costs way more than the printer ever did. So this is what printer companies do. They actually sell the printers at less than what they cost or at just at market value basically they're not making any money on the printer they're going to make their money on the ink and yesterday I went on Newegg and I looked up the cost of a printer as well as ink I found the cheapest printer they had it was an HP desk jet and the printer cost forty dollars the ink which was a package deal that had the, the black and the color cartridge was twenty eight bucks that's not bad for ink but look you're paying ten dollars more for the printer you know and if your printer breaks are you really going to bring it in to get fixed and the answer to that one is no a uh, little story this is when I was working back at um, Best Buy back in the day and uh, we had the service plan the performance service plan if you've ever for those of you who've ever worked at Best Buy you're probably groaning about now uh, we had something called the performance service plan and what that is is that it's an extended warranty okay where the customer can buy it and they get you know more time or they get more coverage well we had this customer come in and she brought a printer in and it was an all-in-one printer and uh, she was a little oriental lady and um, she brought her printer in and she says you know I've, I've got service plan you know I need, need a new computer and we're like okay ma'am so we looked it up and sure enough it was covered it was it was fantastic it was covered well the great thing was that she was eligible for a brand new printer we weren't going to fix it we weren't going to send it out for repair all she had to do was go in the back and get a new printer, and we were done. Well, oh, and the other part of this is, is that the printer that she was going to get was a grade up from the printer she had. We didn't have any, any of that, that level in the market, so we bumped her up to the next level. So she was going to get a better uh, all-in-one printer. So we explained, we're like, man, great news for you. You know, yeah, your printer's dead, but you know what? Fantastic. You get a better printer. Go pick one out. No problem. And she goes, no. I want this printer. And we're like, um, no, ma'am, you know, this printer's dead. Go get a new printer. No, 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 no. No want new printer. Want old printer. Fix old printer. And we're like, um, ma'am, no, you don't understand. You can go get a new printer. She's like, I got service plan. You fix printer. And we're like, um, ma'am, the service plan doesn't cover <laughs> the fixing of the printer. If you want us to fix the printer, it's going to cost money. No cost money. I have service plan. We're like, yes, just go get a new printer. So I did what any responsible tech would do. I called the computer department, the salespeople. I introduced the two together. I said, you know, this is a Mrs. So-and-so, this is Mr. So-and-so. And after I introduced them, I left. <laughs> Four hours later, at the end of my shift, she was still in the back with a computer salesperson saying, I don't want new printer. I want old printer. Fix old printer. <laughs> um, 
the computer guy was not very happy with me the next day. But long story short, printers are for the most part not worth fixing. They're cheap. Uh, you're better off buying a new printer altogether. All right, dye sublimation. Some people are laughing at that. Some people are probably going, man, that was, that was just un-PC, man. Uh, dye sublimation printer. Ideal for high-quality printing where price is not much of a concern. These used to be only in the commercial market. For example, when you bought DVDs or CDs or high-quality imaging stuff, that was dye sublimation. We're seeing dye sublimation in the consumer market with photo color printers. So if you want to you know, print out your own pictures from your digital camera, that would be a dye sublimation printer. And if you remember your old IPC, your integrated physics or chemistry, or your old earth science classes, you'll remember that like evaporation is from liquid to gas, melting is from solid to liquid. Well, sublimation is also a phase change, which goes from solid to a gas. In a sublimation, dye sublimation printing process, we have ink, which is a solid, which is turned into a gas, which is then turned back into a solid on the media that you're printing out on. The interesting thing about dye sublimation is it takes a while. It lays down one color, and then it lays down the next color, and then it lays down the next color, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until the picture is done. Thermal printers, think cheap and fast on these. If you've ever gotten a receipt from a Best Buy, a Circuit City, a Fry's, um, an Albertsons, a Kroger, an HEB, any cheap little receipt is probably done in a thermal printer. It's cheap and it's fast. What happens with a thermal printer is you have special thermal paper which um, is reactive to the heat. So what happens is the paper comes through, you apply heat, and that part where the heat's been applied turns black and there you go. I've only known one person to ever actually have a thermal printer for his home and this was for a Commodore something or other computer, so this is kind of old. Uh, also, the great thing about thermal printers is the paper, after a while, will lose its, will lose its text. If you want to have fun with a thermal printer receipt, put it outside, put it in the sun, and um, it'll disappear. Solid ink, a.k.a. you cannot afford this. <laughs> I was looking on, um, actually, I, this isn't on Newegg. This is a proprietary... Uh, computer. This is done by Xerox. It's a Xerox Phaser, which is pretty cool. And you can buy one from anywhere between $300 and $5,000. So like I said, very expensive. And this is a cross between dye sublimation and an inkjet. The ink is stored as a solid block of color. This is pretty cool. You actually have blocks of color that will get melted inside the printer. And you can add color chips as your, your ink reservoir gets lower. Uh, it's extremely nice as far as image outputs for high quality pictures and unlike dye sublimation which does one coat at a time the solid ink will lay it all down boom done have a nice day I included the link there if you uh, by the way for those of you who are new if you go to mrfordsclass.com you can find the PowerPoint we're doing here are some ink blocks I found these again on Wikipedia there's the source there Laser printer. This is going to wrap up the PowerPoint for today. The laser printers will get their own discussion because they are focused so heavily on the A-plus exam. We will look at, in other presentations, the laser printing process. Let me throw this out to you right now. California cows won't dance the Fandango. And for our next presentation, we'll discuss that. For those of you who are watching this on iTunes, thank you very much. Be sure to leave comments and suggestions on the iTunes page. Right now, we're doing pretty good in the comments as well as ratings. Thank you very much. For those of you just joining us, we will also be doing audio podcasts on the iTunes, but um, the Ustream seems to be going a little bit faster than actually spending weeks and two weeks broadcasting on iTunes. Anyways, you can find all this material on MrFordsClass.com, and as always, I welcome comments and suggestions at MrFord at MrFordsClass.com. Until our next recording, have a fantastic day, and for those of you hanging around, now it's time for Q&A on Ustream. Bye-bye.